I want to introduce a couple of folks to you to begin with. Uh, and they need no introduction, but yet I'm supposed to. Um, Shirley Dobson is a name that needs no introduction to most of us in the body of Christ. She is an integral part of uh, Focus on the Family, uh, the, the ministry that was began. She chaired the board there. But let me tell you something you may, or she, she was on the board there. Let me tell you something you may not know. For 25 years, this lady led the National Day of Prayer. She was doing, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Shirley Dobson was the one under which her leadership, the National Day of Prayer, went beyond a gathering in the park to actually they were invited into the White House and now into the nation's capital. And we are so delighted to have her here today. Do you feel like standing? I know you pulled a little muscle with your luggage, but I want these folks to see you if you can. Brothers and sisters, would you welcome Shirley Dobson to the church today? <laughs> Amen. And you, is that the only... Is that the only outfit he has for you? All right, tell the ushers to get the offering plates ready. Uh, and in case you don't know who this gentleman is, uh, this is Dr. James Dobson, who my wife says. <laughs> my wife says, other than her father, he's the wisest man on the planet. <laughs> Uh, the only exception is he gets real confused about what USC stands for. Oh, boy. There's only one. There's only one. You're, well, we're getting you there. We're getting you there. Um, and I, I don't, you know. Well, we're going to talk to him in a minute, but you know Dr. Dobson, Focus on the Family. Now he continues his ministry uh, with a series called Family Talk. They're a podcast. Uh, it's on the Internet, and we'll show you some links to that later on, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on an introduction. We're going, to take a, we're going out of the norm this morning. We're going to take a few minutes, and we're going to interview the interviewer <laughs> and talk to him for a few minutes. Now, I asked for some folks to give me some questions to submit oh. to James Dobson. My mother sent one that said, where did I go wrong? So I <laughs> threw that one away. She's sitting right there, by the way, uh, beside my father. Um, so here we go. We all see the culture is collapsing. It's in a downward spiral. Uh, talk to us for a minute about the link between the collapse of the culture and the collapse of the family. I'd be glad to answer that, Pastor. I want to also greet Shirley that uh, she was able to be here today Amen. because she's, she's been through a tough couple of days. But I'm going to tell you, we've been married for 57 years. Wow. And uh, <laughs> we think it's going to work. Uh, <laughs> we'll ask her in a minute. It, it, we, we have had an absolutely wonderful marriage. It's not perfect because Shirley's not perfect. <laughs> But uh, uh, other than that, uh, you know, we believe in equal time here, right? <laughs> Don't ask her. <laughs> uh, the culture is in terrible difficulty, trouble today, especially, especially the institution of the family. Uh, that is the ground floor. You know, that's the foundation. Everything of value in a culture sits on the foundation. Our faith, transferring our faith to the next generation. Our institutions, our government, our way of life, everything sits on that foundation. And if you undermine it, if you weaken it, and we are doing that just as systematically as we can, you necessarily threaten the entire superstructure. I'm telling you, it has come down in other cultures in other times because of that. And we're playing with fire here when you start messing with a family. Uh, because that is God's own plan yeah. for the institution of marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see a strategic effort of the enemy? To, is the family targeted? Oh, and absolutely. If so what do we do to thwart that target? I mean, look at what's happening now. Even the very definition of marriage has been changed. Who would have ever thought that? 
Uh, since uh, Adam and Eve and since the Garden of Eden, uh, there has been one plan, one well. Every uh, continent on earth, I guess except the, uh, the Arctic, uh, every continent has had as its basic unit uh, marriage between one man and one woman. That's been the definition. That's not a Christian concept. It came out of the, the Garden of Eden. It came from the Creator. But it's everywhere until our day. And we fooled around and messed it up. And we have now redefined it. And I don't know where that's going. Uh, it's why I left the medical school and why I started Focus on the Family. Because I saw this in 1977. And it's just, I wish I could say we, we stem the tide, but it's rolling now. Well, you certainly, I think you stemmed the tide. I hate to see how fast it would have come about had you not been there leading the cause. And, uh, and, and, and so I take from that the commitment and the call to the church is, is to refocus your efforts on the family and strengthening family Absolutely. ministry and the family unit. And, and we all had better do that. Yeah. Uh, because there's so many enemies to the family. And even the, the, the Congress, uh, do you know that starting in 1969, uh, Congress in its wisdom decided that those who are raising children and preparing lunches and binding up skin knees and taking care of this next generation and spending a lot of money doing it should pay higher taxes than those who are living together without benefit of marriage. Wow. That started in 69. And except for two or three years when George Herbert Walker, no, George W. Bush was president, it has been the case through Ronald Reagan's here, all the conservative uh, Republicans, Democrats, all the way down and to this day. Uh, the, the people who are taking care of children pay higher taxes. That tells you the bias in Washington against the uh, institution of the family. And that's interesting because that doesn't look like a direct attack against the family, but yet yeah. everything that pulls away from that family unit is an attack. Well, sure, you, uh, you know, we, we have a financial base for keeping sure. families together. And why put a greater burden on families that already have, are carrying the load? And then we as Christians are obligated to, uh, to get our children in the hands of Christ. Uh, there's a scripture that I quoted uh, somewhere, I guess, in Washington last week that you don't hear quoted often. Uh, I have not heard uh, a sermon on it in my lifetime, but it is Malachi 15, 2.15, uh, where the Creator, the Almighty, is, is telling why He created marriage. He tells us in one statement there why, what their main job is and, uh, and what their purpose uh, must be. And it's written right there. It says, because I wanted godly offspring. Wow. That's job one yeah. for us. Yeah. And those who are distracted and uninvolved and thinking about other things and working, you know, 10, 12 hours a day and all the other things that can interfere with family life, uh, that's the one that gets hurt the, mo the, the most. Raising godly kids. Yeah. All right, let's shift directions. Let's do. Be careful. Okay. <laughs> I won't talk about football. Um, <laughs> you've authored and co-authored over 30 books. You have interviewed thousands of people. If we went around this room and said, what's your favorite James Dobson interview? Everybody would have something different and they would all be wrong because mine's right. Um, <laughs> you have counseled presidents from beginning President Reagan. You've been in the White House uh, in almost every president except maybe the previous administration. You were at the White House again this week. You were the guy playing pickup basketball with Pete Maravich NBA legend when he had a massive heart attack and he actually died in your arms. You were the guy that Ted Bundy wanted to meet with before he was executed for his crime. So you've got unbelievable high water marks in, in, in your ministry. Give us one or two moments in your ministry that you still look back at 
and say, wow. <laughs> well, you just made reference to one or two of them. Uh, by the way, I, I sometimes feel like Forrest Gump. <laughs> you know, he always it was at a certain place at a certain time. Whenever something was going on in the culture, he there he was. There. Well, so am I. <laughs> but uh, I, think, uh, I think the interview with uh, President Reagan in the Oval Office was a highlight for me. Yeah. I love that man. And he, he was who you think he was. He was just a gentleman, a godly man, cared about the country. And uh, I really had the privilege of working with him for five years in the, in the White House. Um, I uh, also like George Herbert Walker Bush. We interviewed him in our ministry. He, he came there. But I think if I had to pick the, this is hard, because okay. I've done more than 10,000 radio programs. Wow. And I think uh, interviewing uh, Charles Colson yeah. and my friendship with him would would rank at the top because really? I loved that man too. We were like brothers, and he had a great influence on me. So, and, so for the for the younger folks, Charles Colson was the guy who was central in the Watergate scandal. Did not know the Lord, but came to know the Lord. Went to prison for two years uh, because of his role in Watergate. And uh, but when he found the Lord out in the driveway talking to a senator. Man, it was 100%. And from that time on, I never saw him say one word that represented a compromise. Really? He was committed to the Lord to the teeth. Wow. <laughs> and wrote How Now Shall We Live and oh, yes. left a great legacy and testimony. Kingdoms in conflict yeah. and a lot of others. Yeah. Um, all right, let's shift again because we're on a time crunch because I, these people, when they get ready to leave, they just get them and walk out. It oh, happens, boy. happens to that, me every Sunday. That uh, should be a uh, thrill. Uh, <laughs> sitting over there, starting on that front row and going almost all the way to the top, is the next generation. That's our, that's our junior highs and high schoolers that are able to be with us today. You're James Dobson. Talk to them. Well, that's, uh, the young people are the treasure of a church. And... Uh, and you all are, man, I love that. That's a great looking bunch of young people, isn't it? Do you guys love Jesus? Oh, come on. <laughs> Scared to oh, death. Oh, come on. <laughs> Where there were two? Do you love Jesus? No, that won't do either. Do you love Jesus? That's not too good either. You got some work to do. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I got to work on a youth pastor first, but go ahead. <laughs> Before I went into academia, I taught school. I taught uh, sixth grade and then junior high, or we used to call it junior high, I guess middle school now, and high school, and uh, loved those kids. I mean, I don't think I'll ever do anything in my life that I enjoyed more than being with those young people. They're alive. They, I mean, there's verve there. Fresh. So... Uh, I uh, am looking forward to, uh, to seeing you all in heaven. I, I don't know the way you answered that question. I don't know if you're going there. but uh. Preach to him. <laughs> I, I want to say to you, you're living in a, a culture that will not help you be a Christian for the most part. Thank God for churches like this that are supporting you and are behind you in your faith. But as you go through school, and the best, especially those that go into state and, and public universities, they're going to undermine what you believe at every stage. And on some occasions, they will embarrass you, uh, make you feel foolish, uh, make you stand. I've, I've seen all kinds of things that have gone on in university classes. And in fact, I, I taught at uh, USC and I, I saw it up close and personal. And, uh, and even the medical school, I saw it there. So uh, you're going to run into conflict. Satan's going to do everything he can to derail you and derail your faith. And if you remember only one thing that I say today, uh, stay on course. And uh, it doesn't really matter what other people think. 
we know what's right because we have the scripture to show us. And if you, you know, if I had to recommend one scripture to you, if you haven't read it lately, re read the first 10 chapters of Proverbs where the smartest man that ever lived other than Jesus is Solomon. And he talks directly to youth. And uh, that's a good place to begin. I, you know, you're all running out of time. But no, they, uh, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> uh, they better not. <laughs> okay, last, last one. And, and then I've got a way I want to close this segment out. Y'all are okay, right? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the women are away. I noticed that. You know? <laughs> Either that or you got a big problem. I got a big problem. <laughs> well, I got some big problems. Um, <laughs> When I talked to Barry about being here today, I said, now, 200 of our women won't be there because they'll be, or 150 because they'll be at a ladies' retreat. And Barry said, if the ladies aren't there, I don't want to come. Um, <laughs> but the husbands are here, and the, or they better be, and the sons. Talk to husbands and fathers for a moment. Well, uh, nearly everything of uh, significance to all of us is found in Scripture one way or another. And if you want to look at the, uh, what the Bible has to say about the role of men, it's pretty clear. It's first to provide. I, I mean, women can work and provide money too, but it's the man's responsibility to keep them from getting in trouble and to lead spiritually. Right. And that's the second thing, to provide um, to provide uh, spiritual leadership and leadership generally for the family and to protect. Uh, our culture has decided that there are no differences between the assignments and the roles of men and women. And, and uh, men, uh, especially today, I would really like to write about this because, and in fact I have uh, in the past, but uh, men are under assault today. Not only is the family under assault, but the role of masculinity is ridiculed. Just look at the commercials that are on. It's always what I call the stupid guy. Uh, he's always a little overweight and bald, and he is... Uh, he, he, he always does the crazy things. And the, the women are beautiful and coughed. Is that what you call it? Coughed? What do you call a hair when it's done right? A miracle. <laughs> uh, but but uh, they just make fun of men every way they can. Don't forget who you are and what you came to do. You came to lead that family and lead them in the paths of righteousness and to not be deterred by the craziness of the culture. I, there's a little more I could say about that, but uh, you. Well, you probably have written it, and I encourage them to get the book. <laughs> now, I'm going to take a minute. We're going to do two things real quick, so don't okay. go anywhere. One, I'm going to tell you, Dr. Dobson's at a point that he really doesn't have to do anything else. Mm -hmm. But he still continues. And still continuing to advance the cause of Christ in this culture makes you a target, makes him a target. And, and, and I was with him this week, and I saw the countenance on his face change as he received notice that he had been subpoenaed to federal court in Denver, Colorado, to produce anything he's ever written or said in regard to the transgender issue. Mm. Yeah. That, that was a shock. And what, they're, what this court is asking me to produce by next Friday is every email I have ever written. Anything that we have or anything I've ever said. I, I mean, there's just, if, you, if you're counterculture, cultural, you're going to get hit. Yeah. And so what? The, yeah. You know, they didn't like Jesus either. That, that's and true. So you, uh, you just keep going. But I'm going to be in front of a federal court apparently next uh, Friday well, uh, to well, answer all, any and all questions and there is there's another question behind it they don't care about me they don't care they didn't they it isn't about me they're trying to embarrass Donald Trump and they want to see if he's ever said anything to me or if I've ever said anything to him uh, regarding the transgender 
issue. issue. And so uh, that could not be a comfortable moment. I'd appreciate your prayers. Well, we're going to pray in a moment. Um, what I want you to know is he has nothing to hide. Uh, amen. When you, when you come to a moment like this, it's sure good that you're not hiding anything. It's, because, yeah. There are no secrets, um, uh, but he has yeah. nothing to hide. He's written or said what he believes, and that's based on the Scripture, and he doesn't have to be ashamed of that. But here's what you need to know. One of the other things that this will bring about is now Dr. Dobson and Family Talk will spend tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars having to defend their right to free speech. They will be yeah. in court, and they will, they will incur costs to defend their right to free speech. And so I share that with you today to say this. Uh, I would encourage you to go to familytalk.org and support this ministry. Their expenses are about to go through the roof. I was, we were there when the subpoena came in. Right now they're under a $200,000 matching grant. And everything given up to, uh, someone's going to match up to $200,000. So I want to encourage you to do that. If you don't want to do that and you want to write him a check today, uh, just give it to Shirley. But I'm sure that they would appreciate any support because this is, this is one of the attacks of the enemy from the culture at this point in time. We may not be able to defeat you, but we're going to drain your cash. <laughs> we're going to take that's, you to court. That's and we're one, of the, one of the ways they get at you. Yeah. So uh, this is a giving congregation, and you didn't know I was going to do this, I and you're didn't. not comfortable with this, but that's okay. That, those are very kind words, and I do appreciate it. Uh, if you're inclined to feel sorry for us or me, uh, I want to tell you it is an honor to carry the banner. It really is. It, uh... Amen. Well, what we want you to know... What we want you to know is you're not carrying the banner by yourself. I know that. That we are behind you. I feel it in this room. And we can say amen and that's good, but that's cheap. We want you to know in tangible ways that we're carrying this banner with you. Listen, when I walked through that door back there, I felt the spirit of the Lord here. And he is blessing this church, blessing its pastor and its staff. And it's just an honor to be here with you today. Well, before we pray for you, I'm going to tell you what he said last night. He said, if I had this church in my neighborhood, that's where I'd go. I would attend. That's, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so uh, we'll be putting that on our business cards. <laughs> Stand thank right you, here. Stretch your hand this way. Father, we thank you for the Dobsons. And for the ministry that you have given them and how you have used them to shape this nation, to shape our families and shape our homes. And I thank you that he hadn't quit. He could have easily said, okay, I'm done. Let me enjoy some years. But there's still a fire burning. As Moses, there's still a vision that's fresh. And so he's a target of the enemy. His wife's a target of the enemy. Their ministry's a target. But today we stand up and hold up the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ. We declare that no weapon formed against him will be able to prosper. And that every tongue that rises up to condemn, you will turn it around. Let that be seen even this week in a court of law. And let Christ be glorified for the sake of the kingdom of God. And we'll give you thanks and praise for all that you do in Jesus' name. And the church said amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, Dr. James Dobson.